Our first speaker of the day wants to break the cycle of addiction and design system. Currently a senior design manager at Stitch Fix, he is a gay designer who teaches rights and advocates for a more inclusive, just design industry and world. He was the founding design lead at, on Stitch Fix's Mo design system. He also co-founded Queer Design Club, a group that promotes and celebrates all the amazing work that happens at the intersection of queer identity and design worldwide. He also has an English book bulldog pug mix with more Instagram followers than him. Because wait, could we not get the dog? That, that's tragic. Join us to discuss dysfunctional systems, digital products, and addiction. Please welcome John Voss. My name is John. I am a senior design manager at Stitch Fix. I led the founding of our design system mode, which we use to build our client-facing experiences on web, iOS, and now Android. And I'm in the process of growing a team to help us expand our design system. I also co-founded a community called Queer Design Club that connects and celebrates LGBTQ plus designers from all over the world. I'm not here on behalf of Stitch Fix or Queer Design Club today, though. I want to have a heart-to-heart -heart with you about the work that we do. My path to product design wasn't linear. I've bounced around design disciplines and environments, gravitating towards places that had a really loose definition of what a designer's role was. I like too much of the process, from the strategy, to the implementation, to the ways teams work together to get stuff done. That's what I love about design systems. You get to touch all of these different parts of the business, pull it all together into principles, processes, and designs that become a real experience for other people. Which is not to say that I like or am even good at it all. There's always going to be something that makes you say, that's not my job. But in the back of my mind, there's always a little voice that says, well, maybe it could be. I have to tell you now, what I'm going to talk about isn't easy. There are parts that won't be easy for me to share, and there may be parts that won't be easy to hear. I want to talk to you about addiction and how addiction shapes the work we do, and how the work we do impacts the human beings who use our products. I want us to examine the way we think about our work critically, and I'm going to ask you to join me in imagining a healthier future for our field. I might ask you to consider some things that don't feel like they should be your job. But I hope that when you hear that little voice in the back of your head saying, maybe they could be, you hear it out with an open mind. Before that, though, I want to tell you about my dog. His name is Guff. Guff is an English Bulldog pug mix who was rescued as a stray, and he is a character. Since adopting Guff, I have totally become one of those who rescued who people. Adopting him with all of his health problems and personality quirks has taught me so much about love and patience and the importance of pet insurance. Getting ready for this talk, though, I kept thinking about one particular moment with him. Something you need to know about Guff is that he hates birds. You told them. Good job, buddy. Hates them. especially pigeons who are always beating him to the best street treats. The happiest I have ever seen Guff is charging into a flock of pigeons in the park. He would run at them in as close to a run as he ever gets, and they'd scatter and settle, and he'd charge right back in, and they'd scatter and settle again. The sheer joy of it all was like watching a child jump into a ball pit. My husband, Guff, and I recently bought a house on the Sonoma coast, and there aren't any pigeons there. 
but there are wild turkeys. So one day, Guff's wandering in our backyard and he sees a huge flock of turkeys. He charges at them as fast as he can until he's about six feet away and he realizes they are not scattering. So he skids to a stop, realizing in that moment how different his odds look now that he's this close. The lesson in that, the reason I'm talking to you today is things often look different when you get close to them. Eight years ago, my brother Jesse died of a heroin overdose. He struggled with what my family believes was undiagnosed bipolar disorder. He was depressed and anxious about his future. He wrote about being aimless falling leaves. He was a musician and a poet at heart. He was warm and funny. He once threatened to poison me so he'd never have to hear another teacher ask if he was John's brother. It's still one of the nicest things anyone's ever said to me. He was the type of person who would direct all of the love and kindness he couldn't afford himself to you. His loss was sudden and it was sharp. It was the kind of loss that completely severs any thread between your life before it and your life after it. My brother was not the first young person to lose his life to heroin in my hometown. The suburbs are not the first community to be devastated by a drug crisis. But this was the first time in my life that I've ever been this close to such a loss. And things started to look different. Things started sounding different, too. Any talk of addiction or substance use sounded harsh. It stung like little paper cuts, reminding me of that larger, sharp loss. I hadn't realized before then how casually and how often we talk about addiction, from TV show plot lines to daily conversation. We joke about the things we love being our crack or our heroin. We call ourselves reality TV junkies. And as I moved into product design, I heard it more and more. I was struck by just how thoughtlessly we use the language of addiction in our work. We talk about building addictive features of making bingeable content and chasing likes for the dopamine. One of the most popular models of engagement is Near Isle's hook model, which is usually either presented as an infinity symbol or a downward spiral. By adopting the language of addiction and how we think and talk about our work, by focusing on behaviors like daily active use, time in app, and binging, and instead of on the people engaging in those behaviors, we make addiction not just a risk of our work, but the goal. And we've been successful in building addictive products. People spend uncontrollably on freemium games, chasing incentives we've designed to be unpredictable using variable reward schedules. Young people fall into depressions over other people's meticulously curated online lives because in this hyper-connected world, their own social networks have been turned against them to foster fear of missing out or falling behind at a time when those relationships are the most impactful to their development. I think we've all experienced the adverse effects of scrolling instead of sleeping because someone else has removed the friction from and the ability to track our own consumption. Texting while driving is six times more likely to cause an accident than driving under the influence of alcohol. Because in a world of interruptions that prioritizes driving metrics over driving safely, our attention is not our own. This is not to conflate the use of substances and the use of technology, or to raise a moral panic about either. I'm not someone who thinks that technology is inherently harmful because the people who use it look weird to the people who don't. And this is not a talk about kids these days being on their phone too much. We live 
in a digitally connected world that's made amazing things possible. I'm talking to you today across the internet because of relationships I made online, relationships that I value. I met my husband on an app. Digital products allow people from marginalized communities who might otherwise feel completely alone in their day-to-day -day lives find each other and build communities online. When your entire social network is online, how much time in-app is too much? Even researchers aren't totally aligned on digital addiction, whether it's its own disorder or an expression of other mental health issues. That doesn't mean the harm isn't real. Technology has changed the world, and when you change the world, it can take decades before you can even begin to understand how. It wasn't until 1964 that the Surgeon General released a study connecting smoking to heart disease and lung cancer. It took 30 years after that for the FDA to recognize nicotine as a dependency-causing drug. Of course, the tobacco companies knew that smoking caused cancer by the late 1950s. It's 1964 for our industry. Over the decades, the complexity of our products has grown so much that we've created design systems to manage it. And in some ways, we're only beginning to understand the complexity of the systems we build. We can't wait for our work to show up in a diagnostic manual before we start considering the impact it has on the people we create it for. Because while we may not be doctors or scientists, we get up every day and make decisions intended to shape someone else's behavior. Decisions like whether or not we'll implement pagination, a load more button, or infinite scroll. Will that video in someone's feed autoplay? And will another one start right after? Just how many anxiety-provoking red badges will we show the people using our apps? And how much agency do they have in whether or not they see them? What do we give prospects a taste of during their free trials so they let that auto-renew process? How much do we play into people's fear of missing out when they try to stop using our product? And can they take their data with them when they leave? When we frame our work in terms of addiction, of hooking people, of creating habit-forming experiences they can't get enough of, it's easy to let harmful patterns of thought become harmful patterns in our UI. And that can create harmful patterns of behavior in the people who use our products. We don't set out to cause harm, but in accepting the wrong framing of the problems to be solved, we become inoculated to the problems that we create. We track if we are driving use, but not if we are driving value, because it's easier to measure if someone has seen something or clicked on something than it is to measure if that thing has had value for them or how that benefit compares to anything else they could have been doing instead of using our product. What we use to measure engagement is not the full measure of our impact on people's lives, but you only get what you measure. And that's why we see active Twitter users calling it a hell site they can't escape and YouTube viewers logging on for video game hacks and logging off radicalized, or Facebook users choosing misinformation over their family, friends, and their own health. For all the good these products offer, they frame success in such a way that fixing these problems would mean a failure in the eyes of market analysts. And in that way, we've also fallen victim to the addictive mental models that we've adopted. We chase less and less sustainable metrics because we frame success around a principle that can never be satisfied. Addiction only ever wants more. And so we chase 
bigger user bases, more daily active users, and it makes it easy to lose sight of what's in the best interest of those people. Because getting new people to sign up for your product is hard. But getting that person who's already using your product a lot to visit a couple more times a day, that's easy. And that person who's already using your app a lot might not think anything of those couple extra visits. They may even enjoy them. That's the nature of dependency. When we find something that gives us the sweet, sweet dopamine that is so desperately missing from this the year 2021, we want more. So we may run usability studies in which participants tell us they prefer the infinite scroll to having to tap to load more. Or that interruptive notifications are actually better for discoverability. The tobacco industry ran studies that proved smokers prefer the cool taste of menthols. We can't expect every person who uses our products to have perfect knowledge of the potential downsides. That's not about absolving people of personal responsibility for their technology use. Anyone who's known someone doing the hard work of recovery knows that people want to be healthy when they know how and when their environment supports it and when they have access to the resources they need to achieve it. Addiction is a result of complex individual factors, yes, but also environmental, societal, and systemic influences. Right now, though, we put the burden of all that complexity onto the individual. And we've seen the devastating effects of expecting people to understand every aspect of the world we live in, as well as the experts. Just look at where we've ended up requiring everyone to play their own immunologist, pharmacist, and media analyst. We can't just look at KPIs and assume our systems are working as intended. To understand how our decisions are affecting the people who use our products, we need to talk to them. We need to understand them on a human level. We need to value that qualitative input as much as we value the quantitative. Because what are A-B tests, if not studies being run on human participants? You may remember in 2012, Facebook data scientists manipulated what people saw in their feeds to gauge its impact on their moods. Now, if that study was being planned by an academic institution, no community review board would have approved it. Maybe it's time for user studies to have their own external review boards to ensure their safety. We need to start thinking about what informed consent looks like in the studies we run. How do we help people understand the products we build and the mechanics of them in a way that gives them agency? Is there a future in which the cookie settings we see today live alongside settings for managing which in-app experiments you participate in. If that idea makes you uncomfortable, sit with why. If you're just testing how the way you describe your product affects understanding, or how imagery affects conversion, why not be transparent about that? The people who use our products want us to do what we can to create the best experience for them possible. When I log on to an e-commerce site, I want to understand what I'm buying. And usually, I want to buy it. But if you're a social media giant studying how manipulating emotions affects content sharing, or a rideshare app testing just how much you can charge someone during peak hours, I understand why that transparency would give you pause. We've been moving fast and breaking people for so long, though, that maybe a pause is just what we need. Chinese regulators are drafting legislation that would make the basic principles behind algorithmic recommendations transparent to and manageable by consumers. They'd also include an explicit ban on encouraging excessive consumption. Now, 
regulation has its own complexities and dangers that are very real. But at the same time, we expect bartenders to know when someone has had too much. And we hold them responsible if they don't cut them off. Why not expect the same of an algorithm? Eventually, we will be held responsible, if not morally, almost certainly legally. It's inevitable that we'll see increased legislation protecting technology consumers from irresponsible handling of personal data, untested algorithms in the wild, and manipulative design patterns. We shouldn't wait for the lawsuits to start rolling in before we start creating more beneficial, more sustainable, and more ethical products. As the people building the systems that power our experiences, we have a unique opportunity to start today. We can make the right decisions easier to implement. If the fact that a pattern is more ethical and more accessible isn't persuasive to a business partner, maybe the fact that it's ready to go will. We can continue this conversation about how the mental models we share influence the experiences we put out into the world. We can make empathy and kindness and responsibility to one another the foundational principles of our design systems and evaluate decisions against those values instead of the harmful mental models we've allowed to shape our industry. Addiction is a system, and it's been designed. But if we can be more thoughtful, more human in our approach, we can break that cycle that keeps us from always striving towards more instead of better. We have to. It's our job. Sweet. OK. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just been talking to the audience while we got you spread away, just kind of telling them that, yeah, I, I really was actively like enwrapped with your talk because it just never really it didn't really occur to me that you know adopting that language of addiction to describe our jobs and as like really the desired outcome is to like have people exhibit these kind of behaviors like it it kind of rubbed me the wrong way but it never I never really kind of rocked what was actually going on what was the problem it just always felt weird to, to hear people talk about describe something as being like crack or something like that. Like it always felt a little odd, but you just didn't really, I just didn't really connect the dots, you know? So yes, yeah, uh, thank you for all that. Oh, thank you. Um, you know, I think uh, it really is, um, for me, uh, the experience was one of finally understanding what that word meant uh, in a really visceral way. Uh, and I think that, um, that is, you know, one of the things that's really important for every profession to be mindful of is, is what they're actually saying uh, when they are describing their work. Uh, I think it gets played out uh, with designers, um, you know, for uh, every day uh, at very small levels, right? You talk to designers who say um, the goal of this project is to uh, make this module more visible or um, anything like that. And it's like, well, why are we doing that? Um, and just being really explicit about what you actually mean and what you are really trying to do together is um, the first step to doing better work, I think. Definitely. Um, when you were, when I was listening to you speak about this, it, I started thinking pretty actively about TikTok and about how um, that particular app for me has inadvertently become kind of like this weird like craving. I, I hesitate to say the word addiction because I know that's not exactly what's going on, but it just, I am definitely like so enwrapped with that app. And um, I, I feel positive and negative about it because in a way, TikTok is what helped me figure out that I uh, have ADHD. It helped me to recognize the signs and other people who were talking about it. And that led me to seek out my own uh, help and seek out a mental health professional and actually get officially diagnosed. So in that sense, it helped reveal something about myself. But then I started thinking about it. It's like, there's a, 
it seems like there's a disproportionate number of people who use TikTok who talk about ADHD. And someone mentioned, well, it's someone who has a neural, uh, uh, who doesn't have a neurotypical brain who craves dopamine would get really attached to an app that gives you like 30 second hits of like different content over and over again. Like that's really the purpose of the app is to feed in that particular thought process and, and people who have brains who crave these certain things. And I don't know if that's like the, what the end goal of, of TikTok is, but really the end goal is to get guys to keep using them, right? So I guess in that sense, yeah, the end goal is to keep, is to keep me engaged and to keep giving us that, that kind of like that hit of like enjoyment that we were craving. Yeah, I mean, TikTok is a really interesting example. Um, You know, I had the same experience of finding out I have ADHD from TikTok. Um, uh, And I think that, like, the other point you make there is a really interesting one where uh, there's this intersection between um, this ethical concern and actually, like, the accessibility um, component of are we actually designing for um, people outside of uh, a very narrow range of neurotypicality, um, and you know, like I think I think that's really um, at the heart of it. We we sort of allow users or clients or customers to exist in our mind as a hypothetical um, instead of engaging with them as real people. Um, and real people have, you know, different considerations, different life contexts, um, mental health disorders, um, you know, all of these things. People are are imperfect, uh, and so, um, you know, I think for us to be responsible uh, requires really engaging with the the sort of full spectrum of the human experience. Yeah, definitely. It's, I think someone in the chat mentioned it kind of is reminiscent of like the casual way that we approach these really big and sort of very complex topics. It's also the way that people kind of casually throw out um, ableism or we don't necessarily see people as like, we don't, as you mentioned, we don't think about the full range of human experience. So we, we unintentionally, exclude certain types of people or certain types of behaviors because we just want to kind of focus solely on what is the typical like neurotypical experience and I I mean I don't want to get deep into an accessibility conversation right now but I think that there's just so much nuance with um sorry I now that I know that I have ADHD, I can recognize when my brain is having trouble focusing, which is happening right now to me. So I apologize for that. But but basically, um, yeah, I just, I, it makes me really think clear, uh, think deeply about how our jobs are feeding into either reinforcing neurotypical standards or harmfully reinforcing other non-typical behaviors in people. Um, Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, um, this topic uh, for folks who were at Clarity a a couple of years ago, you know, really is uh, reminiscent of Tatiana Mack's talk about system of systems, right? Um, Our design systems exist in a larger concept, a larger context um, in which things like ableism and disregard for people who um, are uh, lower income or dealing with addiction or mental health issues um, is really just ingrained almost to the level of our DNA, right? Um, and this talk, uh, I know, is, is, is maybe overwhelming because it's, it's starting to pull it a thread of, you know, a very large tangled ball of yarn um, where, you um, we have to start rooting these things like unconscious ableism um, uh, and other forms of uninclusiveness out of our products. Um, And to do that, we have to really grapple with some larger issues that are outside of the control even of our company's leadership. So um, it's it's a, a big problem. 
that I imagine we will address by breaking it down into smaller chunks and taking sort of an atomic approach to fixing society. Oh man, fixing society. That's, that's, you know, <laughs> we could kind of go, we could go deep, deep into that for a long time. Um, but yeah, let's, I do want to get to the people's questions. So I'm going to go ahead and switch over here to kind of make sure I can get as many of these in as possible. Uh, so my, the first question uh, is from Christy and she wants to know, uh, what are your thoughts on gamification? Like if it's designed as an intentional and, you know, hopefully non-addictive way. My thoughts on, uh, what was it again? Gamification. Oh, uh, oh, that's interesting. Um, you know, I think it really boils down to um, uh, what we are using gamification to support. Um, you know, like I think, uh, you know, where, uh, our relationship with technology sort of differs from um, uh, other forms of addiction is that it really is um, at its heart, I think, a sort of neutral question of habit forming, right? And are you helping people form constructive habits or are you helping people um, form habits that are going to damage their life in some way? And so, you know, I think like, um, that's one question that I, I would think about, like is always like, what is the end goal? And then also um, how, how well are we staying true to that goal when we gamify things? Um, I think that there's a point um, uh, during sort of this gamification cycle where, um, you know, even the people who start because they want to achieve something greater than uh, whatever the game is, get really hooked on, um, you know, individual rewards or things like that. Um, you know, you might say, uh, imagine a health app that's encouraging you to walk more. And, uh, you know, somebody like gets really into the idea of getting all the badges, right? Um, you know, and in that way, like you can see how uh, uh, having the wrong sort of mental model uh, around a, an admirable goal can still foster um, unhealthy ways of thinking. And so um, I think it, it really boils down to clarity of mission and, and honesty around uh, whether the things that you're building are actually in support of that mission. Um, I think Duolingo does um, a really great job of making it fun to stick with your lessons. Mm -hmm. um, also, sometimes I'm afraid that owl is going to hurt me. And so like maybe <laughs> there's there's an opportunity to pull back a little bit. Um, you know, it, it may be a place where it's it becomes less about the learning. I actually I really do enjoy Duolingo. Um, the, unfortunately, the, the what? Fortunately or unfortunately, I, I don't always keep up with this, so I don't think it quite works on me the way they intended. But I do, I do think they do a pretty good job of making, of kind of keeping you engaged with this positive habit you're trying to form. I okay. think you know, um, you know, one of the things uh, that is, uh, I think, interesting about design. I saw, I saw. Uh, a tweet about uh, design being a social science. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think that there's a lot to that. Um, but at the same time, we're not necessarily held to the same standards uh, or same, same levels of rigor uh, that the actual scientist, social scientists are. Um, and there are times when we, we feel like we can pick and choose, right? And uh, gamification to build a healthy habit uh, uh, seems really positive, and so we'll grab onto that. Um, but as, as soon as we're at risk of uh, losing that client, well, then we'll bring in fear of missing out, uh, mm -hmm. or you know, a broken streak, a crying mm -hmm. mascot illustration. Um, and so I think like we really have to decide, um, you know. If that is how we see ourselves, we need to start holding ourselves to that standard. Definitely. 
definitely. Okay. Um, let's see. Another question we had here was uh, from Mark. Mark said that he really loved your comment about make the right decisions easier to implement. And so he wanted to know what are your thoughts on operationalizing or putting into practice and process those decisions. Um, so for example, preliminary user testing or accessibility and inclusivity uh, and all these things beforehand. Yeah, we are um, actually in the process of um, uh, doing that ourselves um, at Stitch Fix, so thinking about like what are our actual experience principles and how do we operationalize those. Um, I think it really is um, a multi sort of prong approach uh, and a cross disciplinary approach, right? So um, it requires a lot of organizational. Um, collaboration to define what those shared standards are and how we support those behaviors in our process. And so, um, you know, we've we've seen folks uh, talk about sort of the minimal level of accessibility tests that um, uh, products need to pass or builds need to pass, and maybe those are automated. And um, you know, maybe there's a deeper level too where um, where trying to meet a standard of uh, inclusivity beyond some automated minimum and we have a checklist of things that we run through. Um, uh, you know, I think research should always be a part of any uh, large uh, product builds and having a standard for uh, how you ask questions is, is really important in making sure that people aren't um, losing the thread or, or even gaming the results for their own desired outcome. Um, so I, I do think it's possible to sort of operationalize ethical decision making. I think it requires a lot of work across departments. It's not something that can just be done in design or just be done in engineering or, or just be done in the design systems cross-functional team. It needs to be sort of organizational wide. Definitely. Uh Okay, here is the last question. I'm so sorry for all the ones I didn't get to. Um, the last question is going to be from Steven, and he wants to know if apps can produce dopamine in our brains, do we think that the lines inevitably blur between you know, drugs and technology as apps get more and more evolved? Ooh, um, you know, I, I suspect that it will. I am not a technologist or a, a neuroscientist at all. Um, you know, I would say the fact that Elon Musk wants to put electrodes in my brain gives me great pause. Um, and I, I really think that it speaks to that coming future of regulation and, and legal responsibility, um, where even if the physiological response stays where it is today, just the complexity um, and the areas of life into which the technology um, is being integrated is just coming with more and more responsibility. Um, you know, as soon as we have self-driving cars, right? Um, you know, mowing over pedestrians, you you can't just um, live the uh, libertarian front frontiersman life anymore. Um, there has to be some sort of accountability for making sure you you do it responsibly. Great. Um, sorry, my speaker, my headphones went out just now, so I recognize that John stopped talking, but I actually can't hear what he said. So, my, oh, there it goes. We're back. Okay, I can hear you again. Cool. <laughs> sorry, technology is fun. Um, well, anyways, thank you so much, John, for your time. Um, we are um, out of time for this particular segment, but thank you again so much, and thank you for the very thought-provoking talk. Um, I know definitely I'm going to rewatch it again to make sure I get everything, and I believe other people are going to do the same thing. So, um, with that, we're going to go ahead and um, move on to Henri for the next uh, segment. So thank you again. Thank you all.